Thank you so much for the invitation, Zoltan and Pietro, and for the opportunity to see so many old friends and to, uh, and to meet new ones. So uh, I had a wonderful conversation with Ed Rolls at the break about Cortex, and I was tempted to change my whole um, uh, talk into uh, just about our stuff on Cortex. But uh, I'm going to stay with creating modern neuroscience because I think there are some important things to say about the history of neuroscience and about doing the history of neuroscience. So the subtitle is from the revolutionary 1950s to today. And this title is actually from a book I did recently uh, for reasons which I'll show you. So uh, my initial interest in history was in the wonderful decade of the 90s, of 80s to 90s, uh, when the, the neuron doctrine was founded by Cajal, by Golgi, which I helped to uh, revive uh, a number of us, and uh, to give a sense of the richness, the intellectual richness of that time in identifying the neuron as the key to the basis for neurology and for what has become neuroscience. Um, and then more recently, my new passion is recent history because I realized that the memory of our generation of mentors is fading away fast. Our students don't respond to the name Sherrington. They don't even respond to a Hubel and Weasel. And watch out, Zoltan, pretty soon, Zoltan Molnar will be fading away too, as, as with the rest of us. So I, real, and so I began to try to put together that generation, and they all seem to uh, be uh, have made their major contributions in and around the 1950s. And so that's the reason why, after I put all of it together and made this graphic re uh, representation of the key contributions made to what has become modern neuroscience from genes up through protein signaling molecules, up through organelles, physiology, cells and dendrites, circuits and systems. You see, you can't talk about the nervous system without uh, thinking in terms of levels of organization, behavior, and finally, uh, more clinical subjects such as uh, neuropsychiatry, we have theory and technology as driving the, uh, much of this. And then I thought I'd just put in world events because who knows, climbing Everest or the four minute mile might even have been more important for most people than uh, many of the things we're going to discuss. But I think you can see, and I hope you can see from the back, uh, that these are major, major discoveries and the creation of major new <coughs> fields that all happened within more or less this, uh, this decade. And that these are the things that are the basis not only of the progress that was made uh, over the past 50 years, but they are still the things we are still attempting to understand we had uh, some comment about understanding the nervous system. Do we really understand it? Um, but this, these are the conceptual advances and technical advances that laid the basis for what we're still working on. So I want to take you just briefly through this. And much of this is aimed at the young people in the audience because this is recent history. This is not ancient history. This is not... 19th century history. This is history uh, as lived by the, the generation that trained many of us here, 
um, and uh, at least trained uh, probably uh, any younger instructor that you're training with. And so I think this is a very important thing to realize that this, these founders of modern neuroscience and the materials uh, that uh, are associated with them, the equipment techniques uh, and innovations, uh, and uh, any, any materials related to uh, their actual research are going to fade away and be lost forever. So um, uh, pay attention and I'll try to take you through at least some of these things. And I'd like to give you a sense of what was special about many of these advances. I think of this in terms of creativity, creating modern neuroscience, because as you'll see, creation is the, is the key to the advances that, are, that were made. So let's start out, let's pick out just a, a few of them that, have, that uh, you may recognize. So uh, DNA, of course, would define this decade as the most important uh, decade uh, in the history of science and biology and, and neuroscience. Uh, uh, would, it would have a, a reasonable claim on, uh, on it by itself. You would assume, like, uh, if you think in terms of how scientific advances are, are, are promoted over the media, that this would have instantly uh, attracted great interest. But in fact, the first mention of it in the press in the United States was on June 13, which many of you <laughs> will recognize was how long after uh, the first uh, uh, publication in the Letter in Nature in April, about six weeks later. And it shows up on page 17 in the, uh, in the newspaper as a clue to the chemistry of heredity. So these were, these were days when, uh, the, when we uh, biologists uh, pretty much worked in our humble laboratories, um, making, uh, uh, working out what, in, in, in fact, were some of the deepest uh, problems in all of science, uh, and certainly uh, uh, deep, uh, having deep implications for uh, uh, humans uh, in general. So let's then go from DNA to the action potential, and so that takes us up here to the action potential. Again, just uh, the same, uh, just the year before uh, the, uh, the uh, discovery of DNA. And here I've, I've been intrigued by uh, a comment that Hodgkin made. Hodgkin made his first great discovery about the local circuits uh, in front of the, of the propagating action potential when he was still in his early 20s. And as a research student, I did not have a formal supervisor, but there were plenty of people one could talk to about technical matters. This is a wonderful essay to read if you're interested in the creativity behind the uh, discovery of the action potential. When I finished writing my first paper in 1937, I took the manuscript to Barcroft, the head of the department, and asked if it needed his approval before I sent it to a journal. He was quite taken aback and <clears throat> explained that we did not do anything like that in Cambridge, and second, that anything I wrote was entirely my own affair. How many of us have used those words to any of our students? that don't check with me on what, when you publish your thesis, uh, that's not my concern. And so this reflects how much research was done in those days. Uh, you were often given, uh, shown to an empty room, an empty lab for the, on your first day of doing a thesis. This wasn't even a, th a thesis. Uh, and uh, told to get on with it, that it was up to you now to come up with a project. <clears throat> so let's now ask uh, at another level uh, what uh, uh, other kinds of 
advances were made, and one of them was in the uh, under, starting to understand what processing takes place in the nervous system. And here, lateral inhibition was demonstrated by several um, uh, uh, investigators. Uh, Stephen Kufler probably gave the most elegant example of this, uh, an example that also served for the later, the, the subsequent analysis of processing from the retina on up into the uh, visual cortex and beyond. Uh, but you can see that this was an elegant experiment by him himself uh, that uh, defined a whole new approach to the uh, understanding of the nervous system. Uh, Jack Eccles, around this time, was uh, carrying out the first intracellular recordings from the, uh, uh, using the spinal cord, which was the main model system of the time. And this is from his 1957 book, uh, summarizing his research. Uh, and, what I, and so this was the first uh, insights into how integration takes place within a uh, nerve cell. And in addition, since you could now deliver, the, the equipment had been developed so that you could now deliver repeated shocks to uh, the nerve, uh, in this case the dorsal root coming into the spinal cord, and record intracellularly from the cells responding to that, you could work out the synaptic delays and the connections between uh, uh, the different types of cells. So I think this is, was the first example of a nerve pathway, a circuit pathway uh, that, uh, in the nervous system, and it served as a model for uh, the subsequent analysis in the rest of the nerv uh, nervous system, which started in, in uh, the 1950s. So if we go to uh, uh, then higher in the, among the uh, uh, circuits of the brain, uh, the cortical column was really one of the most important uh, breakthroughs. And this is from Mountcastle's evidence in 1957 for the columnar segregation of skin and deep receptors <coughs> in areas one, two, and three of macaque somatosensory cortex. Um, I, I, I think this is from his original uh, and not from the, the uh, or could have, could have been from the uh, work that he did with Tom Powell here at Oxford when Tom joined him for a year to work on the correlation of the physiology with the anatomy. Uh, the cortical column was a key, and with Colin here and, and a number of others who have worked on the uh, visual system, it was really a key. It, gave, it really gave hope, first of all, that the nervous system was decipherable, and second, it gave the tool to uh, the tools to uh, uh, assess that. When I was here in 2009, um, I uh, was asked to, uh, to uh, lead a, uh, an informal seminar, and I used the review by Horton and Adams in 2005 uh, as a, uh, to organize the discussion because they put together all of the evidence about columns and uh, uh, pointed out that in terms of orientation columns and ocular dominance columns, there was great uh, 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 controversy because some of these columns were present in some species and uh, absent in others. And the same with ocu ocular dominance columns uh, and, uh, in strike cortex and uh, <coughs> in some species and also in some individuals of species that otherwise, uh, otherwise had them. So um, the important thing is not that that idea turned out to be true forever, but rather it was true for a critical stage in the uh, analysis and opening up of understanding of a, uh, and making progress with a given area. So um, I'd like to then uh, end on a more personal uh, note because I think I may be the only one here who was publishing in the 1950s. Uh, if there is any other old timer who would like to challenge that statement. Hey, there we are. No, no, no. Oh, no. Ray, Ray Guillory. Ray. Ray, no, I'm not sure. Ray is still a youngster. 
So uh, anyway, my first publication was in 1957, uh, based on some work I did in 1956 when I was in medical school in Boston, uh, in the laboratory of Norbert Wiener, uh, using an analog computer to calculate auto and cross correlations, in this uh, case, of uh, ventricular fibrillation. Uh, I then was lucky to be able to come to Oxford. So this is, I'm going to end on an Oxford note. Uh, this is Charles Phillips, uh, who I uh, came to work with on the uh, motor cortex in the monkey. Uh, uh, and this was is from his first uh, groundbreaking work in obtaining the first intracellular recordings from a neuron in the brain above the spinal cord. So I thought I was going to work on motor cortex, um, but we, since I insisted I was interested in the best model for local circuits, uh, we decided on the olfactory bulb. Uh, I got wonderfully inspired by Charles in this work, and two of the things that I, car I carried with me were uh, his saying, when I come into the laboratory in the morning, I hang my thinking cap with my coat on the hook outside in the hall. So there was very little small talk in the lab. The lab was a place, particularly during term, where you came in and worked desperately hard to get something done before you had to uh, do your tutorials the next day. And the other was that every result is an artifact until through another one. And I think every electrophysiologist certainly knows that from experience. So my other mentor was Tom Powell, uh, and uh, he had just returned from that year with Vernon in 1957, 58, uh, or 58, 59. He'd just returned, and so we needed uh, anatomical correlation of the pathway of the recording electrode, and so I was fortunate to have him working with me uh, on, uh, to establish where the... Uh, the uh, uh, physiology related to the different layers. So um, I gave my first talk then uh, in the department to, I think we're going to hear more about Legro Clark. Uh, so Legro was the chair and he sat in the front row when I uh, gave, gave my, uh, my talk. Uh, he and, and so this was uh, the first circuit that we uh, devised uh, to uh, 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 in the same way that Eccles had used physio those, those physiological techniques to work out circuit uh, mechanism uh, connections, uh, this was our, uh, our uh, scheme for the olfactory bulb. I think one of the first in the early 60s for Central Region, uh, about the time that uh, Per Anderson and Eccles and uh, uh, Eccles and St. Agatai were, and, and Ito were doing their work in the cerebellum. Um, another uh, step forward in the 50s was the work that, that um, Edgar Adrian did in the olfactory bulb along with Legros. Uh, and so they, had, they obtained both anatomical and physiological evidence for there being spatiotemporal patterns of activity involved in processing odor information. However, uh, they couldn't relate it to any cells or any layers, and so I made my pilgrimage to uh, Cambridge to ask uh, Lord Adrian uh, his opinions about our recordings. And if you uh, know anybody who ever had interacted with Adrian, you were usually talking to his back because he really had to get somewhere else and couldn't wait uh, uh, to uh, uh, talk much longer. But he did say over the shoulder, look to the glomeruli. And we did look to the glomeruli. And 10 years later, we <coughs> used the 2-deoxyglucose activity mapping of the, uh, to uh, show that there indeed was a pattern of activation of the different glomeruli, uh, modules somewhat like cortical columns, that are now the basis of understanding uh, or beginning to understand olfactory processing. So let me end then with uh, this schema, which is in this book I wrote on creating a modern neuroscience. Um, and so I'd like to suggest that if you're interested in 
modern history <clears throat> that each one of these entries is an origin of something critical for modern neuroscience. Uh, and it can be at the cellular level, at the molecular level. Um, it can certainly be at the neuropsychiatric level where uh, the discoveries in the 50s pretty much revealed all the basic uh, uh, types of uh, neuroactive substances that are used in the treatment of psychiatric disorders. Uh, but even, uh, even in uh, terms of reticular, the reticular system, ethology, operant conditioning, HM, uh, you, can, you see that each of these is the origin of something that is critical. And so my suggestion is that unless there are students coming into the field who will help to trace back uh, any of these, uh, any of the things they're working on, like LTP or, or um, uh, heavy and synapses and so forth, we're going to lose that critical link to, to history. And it, it, I, I, I'm always struck when uh, older history is discussed, as we've had today, in, in the wonderful um, uh, uh, examples of cinematography uh, and of Galileo and so forth, that there are real materials, there are, are practical hard copy materials of those historical uh, documents. Uh, it, it, <clears throat> I think we all understand that the, the progress that we're engaged in now uh, involves records that are gone often the day after we publish that paper. And so this, these are opportunities, I would suggest, for us to, uh, to really, uh, I think, beginning with FENS, uh, I've also uh, uh, been involved in supporting the history of neuroscience in the Society of Neuroscience. Uh, I think this is something that uh, institutionally we should take very seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you.